Um, another one I was talking about here. So I quickly saw this and I thought this was hilarious because um, this kind of speaks to this weird place we're in now in culture where I think most people are understanding now that the whole anti-council culture people out there used it as a ruse to basically signal amplify themselves, right? To put themselves up on a pedestal, put themselves up on a soapbox and to basically make themselves more famous. Like, I think at first it was a little bit, you know, malicious council culture. It was done in a way to sort of like bring down certain people and to maybe allow the people who were doing the counselling to take their positions because some of them probably felt like they were unrecognised geniuses who never got the praise or the chances or the opportunities that they probably thought that they were deserving of. So what better way to take that chance than to bring somebody else down and lift yourself up so cool happened that way but i do think it had some utility because as i said before as much as i dislike and hate counter culture i think the utility in it is when it's a crime i would say crime when it's in a when it's an incident that can't be punishable in the court of law but you can maybe let that person suffer some sort of reputational damage, right? That's important. If the person embarrassed you when you were coming up or they abused you or made you feel less than, if you have an opportunity to kind of like air them out and expose what they did to them, what they did to you, nowadays where people are a little bit more empathetic to that kind of, you know, cause, you could probably make them suffer some reputational damage and that might be, that might make you sleep better at night to know that, you know, they've, you know, maybe not got a job anymore or that they've, all their news, all their business is plastered all over social media. But on the other side of things, nowadays I'm seeing it's being used more as a ruse, more as a grift, to be honest, to make it seem like the person who's talking about anti counter culture is like the primo truth teller. And there's no better example of it than Joe Rogan now. And again, I'm upset about it because I fucking love Joe Rogan. But Joe Rogan's becoming the number one grifter when it comes to this cancel culture lark. It's just annoying because it just goes on and on and on about the same thing. And it's like, hold on, bro. How can you be talking about you're not allowed to say certain things when you just got 20, 250 million from Spotify? before the other 200 million you got before that like how are you being denied the right to say certain things when you are one of the richest people in the world and you have access to most of the people to talk to who you want and you'd never been deplatformed? like how does that make any sense so let's play this clip it features um rogan and chris williamson on his recent podcast talking about um how you can't tell the truth anymore you get punished i think it's incredibly insulting to those of us who actually have, who actually have to live in the real world so let's see what these guys are talking about because i think this is absolutely stupid so let's play this video Another one would be uh, what makes a woman attractive? Oh. Because the socially acceptable answer to that is one that is untruthful. And the problem with this is... What is the socially acceptable answer to that? It would be to do with... Uh, it, it's about grace and poise. You know, it, anything that isn't big titties. Like, <laughs> if, if, you say, if you say big titties, right. that's... You failed, right? You can't say big titties. Well, you, you can't, can't say a nice ass. you're single. You can't if you... Who said that, by the way? Who said... You can't go on social media and say that the, your preference is big tits. Who said you can't go on social media and say your preference is massive, crazy, fake BBLs? Who said you can't go on social media and say you want a girl with massive dick sucking lips? Who said you can't say that? People say that all the time. People say that even without saying that by sharing, you know, unlimited amount of images of people that they've never met on their fucking feed. Oh, I've got a crush on this person. This person makes my wee wee hard. All these sort of stuff. People say it all the time. So what is this notion that you can't say these certain things? It's absolutely preposterous. Yes, you can't go out there and... No, you certainly no, you can't. But it's not advisable to go out there and denigrate people who don't fit your fucking vision of beauty, right? Or your preference in order to lift up people that you do like. That's just mean, right? Why would you go out there and purposely call somebody fat and say, oh, I would never fuck you. You're too fat, but I'd fuck this person. There's no need to say that, obviously. But that's just like general manners. There's no need to put somebody down to put somebody else up. You know what I mean? That doesn't make any sense. So I don't get this whole like, oh, you can't say this, you can't. Yes, you can. You can say what the fuck you want. But obviously, you have to face the consequences of what you do say if somebody doesn't like it. That's all are worried about acquiring a mate you can't if you are of a social dynamic that needs to have your job and you have a human resources center that's very stringent they're very strict about what they allow their people to you might affect your possibility of getting a promotion might affect your standing amongst mm -hmm. the women in the office you know they don't like when you tell the truth chris you but that's how most workplaces are 
I don't think you could rock into Joe Rogan's studio whereas he books you as an interviewer and tell him the truth about how he is, tell him the truth about his political opinions, tell him the truth about his worldview, tell him the truth about his unfunny friends. He also wouldn't receive that well. So we all, we're all not really attuned to receiving or to listening to the truth. Radical honesty is radical because most people don't want to hear it. Right, you have to have a semblance of like, you know, manners or semblance of like, um, you know, common decency to tell people certain things in a certain way. And in the workplace, it's no better example of it. If you want to keep your job, which allows you to pay your bills, allows you to flip in, you know, put your kids through school and go on holidays or buy yourself like fancy trainers, it's probably advisable to keep some of your opinions about your female colleagues' looks to yourself. Why would you go out there and purposely tell them that they're ugly or tell them that they're fat? Like, why would you do that? It makes no sense. It's not the company that are like stifling your free speech because all you need to do is walk out of that building, go to a bar somewhere with your colleagues who you trust and suddenly you can talk about those things that you want to talk about. Like we all do, right? At work, we don't really, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I'm the kind of person, I don't even gossip or go that crazy on my work slack, on my teams. I don't even do that. I don't even do that. Like, I'm not even going to risk that. I'd rather do it on like a group chat somewhere that's separate or something. But I'm not going to be talking crazy about my colleagues on a fucking company Slack and a team and then get surprised. I know they're not allowed to obviously look inside it, but then get surprised when some of those flipping comments I've made get used um, to kind of, you know, put me down or maybe to kind of discipline me or to, you know, for worse, kind of fire me. Like, it's just common sense. Like, it's not like they're stifling your free speech. It's just you being smart about what you say based on the environment that you're in because everything that you say whenever you say it has consequences even if you say something bad about somebody in the bar and it gets back to people in the office you could have you could face some level of consequence yes it's not fair because you're not at work but you have to be mindful of who you're speaking to you know of who you're speaking to what you're saying and sometimes you have to also be mindful of like saying is it worth even talking about is it worth even mentioning really does this really do anything for me does this advance anything forward like you know it's not it's, some things are just some things are better left unsaid as they say work with women you can't say i think women with big asses and big tits are hot as fuck <laughs> you can't say that you can't say that, that even though bad. they know that it's true yeah you can't be a good person you can't be a good person and even admit that that's what i'm attracted to the only thing i would say that is probably something that's i've noticed that's really interesting as a observation when it comes to like conversation around beauty i think there is a lack of honesty from women probably generally on social media or in the world about how difficult it is for a man to go from like zero to like a, an eight. I think most women could achieve that through makeup, right? Especially if you've got your, let's assuming that you're, that's assuming that you've got like an average body, you're not super fat, your assets are where they should be, all that sort of malarkey. A woman could inf improve their face card tenfold by just, you know, getting better at makeup and understanding what works best for them, what to accentuate. Men don't really have that. The only thing that we have close to makeup is a beard and a haircut. But then again, you have to still hope that you have a good face because a beard and a haircut isn't going to save you if you look like fucking chin, right? You still need to have a good grill, but you can't improve that grill with makeup as a dude, especially as a straight dude. You can't really do that. So I think there's a lack of um, understanding, lack of appreciation of just how difficult it is for men to go from looking like shit to go from looking like unattractive to attractive. Whereas I think women can do that. An unattractive girl can really take herself from a zero to a six pretty easily. Even if she's fat putting on a, some spanks, putting on a nice outfit that accentuates whatever she has as a main asset, improving the makeup that she does. But I don't think men have that leeway. So the reason why, so we don't have that leeway. So I think that's why this is a weird stretch. I know this is a, bear with me, this is a weird stretch. But I think that might be the reason why people get infatuated with the, with the gospel of Andrew Tate, with the gospel of Fresh and Fit. Because those guys, as much as they talk about going to the gym, the thing that they talk about the most is money is ascertaining wealth money 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 because they know that the biggest way to improve your chances of who you can get as a mate or as a sexual partner is to increase how much money you make suddenly then you become appealing to everybody it's like that great future quote right um when you've got money you're everyone's type right you're what that's i love that fucking quote from him very toxic but it's very true so i think that's why most guys who are stuck and know that they don't have good DNA, they don't have sorry, they don't have good genetics. Um, even if they got a beard and they get a hair transplant, nothing's gonna change really because their face and their grill, their posture's all over the place. But if they invest in stocks, if they invest in a startup, if they invest in some fucking drop shipping thing and they get some money, 
and it improves their fucking appearance on social, they know it, inc- it, it goes tenfold to increasing the options of the women that they get. So that whole mating relationship process thing is completely different for the sexes. It's really different. And that, again, might be the reason why the likes of Andrew Tate and the Fresh and Fit and all those kind of guys have become very prominent with some guys because, you know, some guys are just like, hey, I can't do much. Like, I don't have a good base. Um, my voice is horrible. I've got terrible acne. My hair isn't growing right. All this sort of stuff. But if I just get money, then suddenly I can date fucking models and porn stars, which is what most of them end up doing, which is really funny. When, which, is, which is odd. When punishment for what people say becomes widespread, people will stop saying what they think and instead say whatever is needed to thrive. Right. And this is why limits on speech become limits on sincerity. I think the most concerning thing for me when it comes to limits on speech is definitely for regular people. I think the, the worst thing is that story, that iconic story in that book about that lady that was going to Africa. He was like, oh, she texts she, she does a tweet and the joke is like, oh, I'm, I'm going to Africa, um, hope I don't get AIDS. And then by the time she lands, the tweet goes viral, she loses her job, she gets docked, all this sort of shit, right? That I think is way more concerning than some comedian who gets told that their joke is insensitive and they have to apologise. Because regular people having their lives destroyed because of some off-colour joke they said on Twitter is fucking awful. That is actual counterculture that we should be, care- that we should be kind of trying to... Um, abolish right we should be trying to kind of fight against not these comedians people who use cancel culture as a promotional tool use it as a marketing fucking routine oh my god they won't let me say this here's the joke that netflix wouldn't let me put in their special but all this sort of nonsense they use to kind of build themselves up we don't give a fuck about that i care about the regular folks who can't say what they want to say on social who can't like suit some who can't like have a bit of banter online and shit and then it kind of ends up impacting their real life and then that ends up impacting their relationships their family dynamics all this sort of nonsense i don't care if some comedian can't say a certain joke in a certain special because they can if they want to but they just use it as a ruse to kind of profile and bump themselves up i flipping hate it personally i flipping despise it and i wish it would stop talking about it but i find joe to be interesting because joe has this ability to keep talking about the same thing ad nauseum and not get bored of it like he doesn't get bored of the sound of his own voice when he speaks about counterculture like, it's interesting, though, isn't it? Like, because I know for me, I have people on my pod um, leave me comments, send me emails, send me DMs, numerous DMs about how often I repeat myself, about how often I repeat a sentence or a story, right? Or to emphasize something is they say how annoying it is. And I understand that sometimes I do it on purpose, sometimes I don't do it on purpose. But Rogan has like five or ten subjects that he just repeats ad nauseum. Right, council culture, um, one thousand top comedians, something about apes, the guy with the fucking what you call it, um, what you call it, Oppenheimer. Like he has these things that he just talks about, like, uh, fucking again and again and again. DMT, and it he doesn't, he never gets bored. And I'm wondering if that's probably one of the reasons why he's so successful. That ability to just keep going on and on and on about the same thing just bringing the fucking hits right the the big hits the top 10 hits of rogan it's fucking amazing how he does it it's honestly one of the most impressive things about him so big up rogan big up rogan